the next thing we're going to do is we're going to, um, so these integrals, we're going to, well, immediately we're going to switch to, to one dimension. Right? We're going to work in 1D to teach the concepts of finite differences and other things. We're going to work in, in one dimension for a while. So I'm just going to rewrite this equation, but in the one dimensional form, um, we're going to have in our one dimensional domain, you can think of like a core, right? So it's going to so it'd be go have from zero to L. So zero to L, uh, and, and this is X here. So this is, say, a core right, uh, of porous medium. So uh, in one dimension, this equation then reduces. Now the integral over the domain is just in one dimension, so it's zero to L. W of X, now X is just a scalar because it's just one dimension. Again, zero to L. Oh, and I guess it's not the integral over the boundary, but rather, uh, of course, the integral over in one dimension, the boundaries are just points, right? They're the endpoints of the domain, and so we don't, we can't take integrals over points. So this just becomes an evaluation at the points zero and L. Okay. So now what we can do is we can take our 1D domain, it goes from 0 to L, and because the functions are continuous between 0 and L, we can basically just split this integral up into increments. So uh, if we have a point x0, um, then this would be, this increment is delta x0, and then you could have another point and they don't necessarily need to be equal increments. You could have a point x1, and this distance would be delta x1. And you could have another point x2, and this distance is delta x2, and another point x3. Um, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and make it general. And so out here on this end, we're going to have a point xn minus 1. And this is going to be delta xn minus 1, n minus 2, delta xn minus 2. And of course, the minus 1, the reason it's, you know, so there's, there's n segments, right? So we broke it up into n segments. Uh, but our zero, you know, we're indexing from zero, and this is just to be consistent be because we're going to, you know, later program in, in Python, which is zero index. So just to be consistent with our programming language, uh, we'll we'll have a zero index there, right, at the beginning. So then we're going to have n segments. That means the last one is the n minus one segment, right? So we're gonna we're gonna break break up, you know, our integral, and so then. Uh, because again, because it's continuous, I can take any continuous domain from zero to L and spl split it into the sum of, uh, of integrals uh, to the sum of these individual integrals over these individual domains, right? That go from zero to, to delta x zero and from delta x zero to delta x one and so on. So if we do that, we do that, and we, then we can re rewrite this equation as sum from 0 to n minus 1 of 
the integral from xi minus delta xi over 2 to xi plus delta xi over 2. So we have that. So up to now, we said w is an arbitrary function. And now we're going to choose a w. Right? So again, it's arbitrary, which means it's anything. Right? We can make it anything. And so for our purposes now, we're going to choose w of x to be equal to the delta function x minus xi. Okay, so what is a delta function? And sometimes this is called the Dirac delta function. So it's a special function that takes on uh, the value uh, at the delta function at 0 is equal to infinity. Uh, and well, let's, let's write it like this. The delta function at x equal to 0 is equal to infinity. And otherwise, so x not equal to zero, then it's equal to zero. And it has some special properties that we're going to exploit, and, and so a couple of those we'll write down. So the integral uh, from minus infinity to infinity of the delta function of x dx is equal to one. Also, another one is something called the sifting property, and this is what we what we like about it here. So if I have the integral over any symmetric interval, so a minus epsilon, a plus epsilon, f of x delta x minus a dx, that's going to be equal to f of a. And then another property is with relation to the derivative. So if we have something f of x times the derivative of the delta function of x minus a, then that's equal to the derivative of f of a dx. And that that should be sort of self-evident by the fact that you know I could I could integrate this guy by parts, uh, shifting shifting this derivative onto this function, uh, and then use the first property to get back uh, f of a. Of course, then there's some boundary terms which end up being just evaluations of the delta function at constant values, which then using this guy is zero. Okay, so. With that, with these sort of properties in hand, we're going to choose w of x to be this delta function, and we're going to plug it back into this equation. Right? So we're going to plug this in here, here, and here. And what's going to happen is, uh, of course, when we when we plug it into the first term. We're going to have something that looks like this, and we're going to exploit that property. Uh, when we plug it into the second term, we're going to have something that looks like this, and we're going to exploit that property. And when we plug it into these boundary terms, we're going to have delta functions that are evaluated at delta x over 2, which are just constants. And so then we can exploit this uh, and to eliminate those terms. So I'll just write down. the final answer, or the collapsed answer here, 
is the sum oh I just realized I forgot a negative sign there's a negative sign right here okay so So the sum of v of xi partial t minus alpha partial squared v of xi partial x squared so, so it kind of appears like we went through a whole lot of work to just get back the same equation, only instead of having p of x, now it's p of xi. And of course, this is implicitly also t, right? It's still the function of t. Right? So basically, what we've said is that now the, the, the solution is going to be the sum of a whole bunch of solutions, or you know, the sum of a whole bunch of evaluations of this equation at discrete points xi along the domain. Like that. So again, it, it sort of appears like we did a lot of work uh, just to just to replace x with xi. But the important thing that turned you know it turns out to be important later is the summation over here, right? And so now we need a way to approximate these derivatives, right? So ultimately, the purpose of doing this is that we want to be able to solve this equation for any, you know, arbitrary domain where we may or may not be able to solve this equation analytically. We can always come up with a computational scheme, right? And so what we've done here is done a discretization where we're going to take whatever, you know, some smooth, continuous solution, some continuous solution as a function of x and we're going to break it up into a bunch of sort of piecewise constant solutions right? <clears throat> and so our approximation will be uh, and of course then as, as we as these uh, domains get smaller then we can have a more refined approximation to our solution Okay, so what we need to solve this is we need to turn these derivatives, we need to turn these derivatives into, you know, discre we need to discretize these derivatives or come up with approximations for the derivatives. And the way we're going to do that is through finite difference approximations. So that's what we'll talk about next.